do the acknowledgement to country. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, uh, which or we meet, which is the uh, Wurundjeri and uh, Jajarung country, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here uh, today. So tonight we have uh, Andrew Gill from SES uh, joining us. Um, and Andrew's going to take us through a bit of flood safety um, and just ways that we might be able to best interact with uh, SES when we need to support them, uh, which is a bit pertinent given we've got full dams and lots of rain on the way. So Andrew, uh, I'll let you uh, do a bit more of an introduction, tell us a bit about yourself and then um, get into it. Oh, and just while I'm, while I'm here, yeah, can I remind you. everybody to turn uh, who's not presenting to turn off their cameras and mute their microphones. Um, really important. Uh, we do notice that a few people have still popped up with their cameras on in some of the video recordings. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, um, Michelle. I'll just see if I can share my screen, which may take a little bit. Um, waiting for it and it's not popping up the same way. Just bear with me. Here we go. Have we got um, got that, Michelle? Uh, yes, we do. That's up now. Ah, fantastic. Thank you for that. And uh, once again, thank you, Michelle, for this opportunity um, to be part of your skills online. So, yep, my name's Andrew Gill, um, Operations Manager based in Bendigo, and I look after the emergency management for the Lodden Mallee region. So um, that's uh, uh, the Northwest uh, region. So that'd be District 2, District 18, and District uh, 20, I think it is, Michelle. Yeah. Um, so um, all the way through um, up to Mildura. Um, so I've been with um, uh, SES uh, for around right about uh, eight years, and previous to that um, with CFA, and uh, for a number of years, a CFA uh, volunteer as well. So um, uh, a varied background um, over a number of years. SES, um, as you may mainly know, would know, sorry, uh, control agency for storm, flood, earthquake, landslide and tsunami. And uh, we're also the largest provider of road crash rescue um, and have been for a number of years. Um, Tonight, what I want to do is actually provide um, provide you a, an overview of the current weather prognosis uh, that we're looking at, um, our some of our preparedness that we're doing, in particularly in this region, and um, then of course we'll look at the roles and support of agencies uh, to Vic SES for storms and floods. Um, I want to touch on a little bit of sandbagging, and I'll tell you why as we go through that and of course some swift water rescue, the do's and don'ts. And um, the main theme across all of that is about safety, um, uh, not only of ourselves, but of the community. Hopefully at the end, um, you'll have a greater understanding of how we can all work together uh, during storm and flood events. And it's been proven we've done this um, uh, collaboratively very well um, in the past. So we'll move on. Okay, so spring and um, through to the summer. Um, so spring, windiest month of the year, as we know, we've got uh, an increase of year thunderstorm risk and we've got a bit of a risk of that tomorrow as well. 
Um, and this is where it, uh, particularly in the spring period, it's a normal occurrence that we have um, uh, some weeks, uh, and at the moment it's rolling every weekend. We're starting to get potential of rain um, and thunderstorms and so on. And this is very much like what we had um, back in 10-11, um, actually, um, the uh, slow build-up. At the moment in our region, that's not too bad. Certainly the northeast um, stepping up again uh, this weekend. So we're looking at um, with this uh, La Nina, uh, the forecast. Um, it's uh, the bomber pretty confident. They started talking about it about three or four months ago. Um, and they're forecasting this intense rainfall. So um, as with this weekend, um, what happened is, of course, as um, fronts move across through to the eastern states, it's drawing the tropical moisture from the north um, and um, bringing with it um, intense rain um, and so on. So there's that potential for flash flooding. Uh, Localised landslides, we've been seeing that over in the north uh, northeast and certainly even on the Great Ocean Road um, the weekend before last. Um, and of course, um, uh, severe and above fire danger, um, for you guys, you would all understand that. Um, for us, uh, damaging winds as well, which causes, of course, trees over roads, on houses um, and so on. So what's happening since the last major flooding in Victoria? Um, we've got a really good partnership with uh, DELP, um, particularly the, the water side. So DELP also look after um, dams and so on. And so uh, we have a close relationship with them um, with that. The uh, CMAs, and that's the Catchment Management Authorities, um, and uh, their local knowledge on, on um, how floods are occurring or what the potential is as well. And of course, our local councils. Flood Zoom. Uh, Flood Zoom is a pretty high tech um, uh, program that um, our flood analysts use and we use uh, constantly during floods. And what that does, it has uh, predictions, different layers in mapping um, and uh, of townships of what could occur depending on rainfall. So we can actually type in what's occurring and it'll give us the predictions. It also enables us to actively monitor inflows and outflows of dams, including Tullaroop, Cancurran, and also Epilock and what's going on there. So we know what's going to occur downstream. Um, we've done heaps of flood mitigation works, warning systems, all those sorts of things uh, collectively with other agencies as well. Um, and we sit on uh, those committees that uh, look at the uh, works that are re required. Um, and of course, um, there's been a number of levy banks and so on done up north. Um, and we've also increased uh, flood warning services um, um, and prioritise where they need to be in, in particular for us, Carisbrook and, and uh, Charlton. So what's the difference between everybody talks about um, uh, this year and what's occurred previously? Just um, show you, um, I've got two uh, maps there, the brown, of course, um, and that's all you could call it was brown. That's last year, the October to December, that was the rain outlook. Um, and of course, as you know, 1.5 million hectares fire um, affected. Um, then if we go across to today um, and October to December 2020, um, it's, you know, blue. Um, and of course, that means that um, we've got a higher, much higher outlook um, for um, a pretty wet sort of um, October through to December. And they're actually looking at the moment that it's more likely to be towards the end of December um, or in that December, January period. But uh, let's see how that unfolds. Um, we've got to remember too that, um, uh, that roughly um, about 2.5 million hectares across Victoria um, uh, subject uh, to flooding to, uh, due to severe um, rain events as well. Um, and if you recall back in uh, 2016, 
So we saw um, some widespread flash and riverine um, flooding. Um, the 2016 event, um, predominantly on the Murray River. Um, however, down in the Barwon Southwest, um, that uh, in particular around Coleraine, um, around the 9th of September, I think, um, we didn't um, conclude flood operations um, until um, December, uh, around the 16th of December, um, when the Murray River um, uh, passed over into the South Australian border and we were able to give it to them. Um, so it was a pretty long um, uh, duration of event for us. Um, but interesting um, that following that 1617 uh, period, um, there was something like um, 1,015 fires that burnt, um, about 13,500 hectares. So just because we're having flooding doesn't mean we're not going to have um, some of those other um, incidents in particular fire. Okay, so um, our spring summer preparedness. So um, we're preparing as an agency for a campaign like you guys would have last year um, for fire. Um, uh, for us, um, it means um, a very long duration of preparedness, um, particularly with the Bureau on their forecasting. So a few months ago, we started our preparedness um, and where we could possibly be. Uh, in particular with the Bureau and with DELP. And when I talk about the Bureau, it's not just the Victorian uh, side of um, things, it's also um, New South Wales, of course. So we've had meetings with both sides of the border regarding that. Um, we expect that if we do have something um, up to seven weeks and possibly longer, of course, with the Murray River, and if we look at, uh, and you'll see in the red, I've got um, RL5 and RL4 and so on, that aligns with some of the fire um, ratings, um, red being um, the most ex extreme um, uh, days that we've been in operation. So particularly along um, with the Loddon Alley and Hume, um, quite significant. So, we just go back to the 2010-11 um, floods and this year they're looking at uh, similar to 2010 and 12 and 2012 um, is actually around about um, due to the northeast in flood so not only um, Lod and Mallee. So if we go back okay um, seven and a half thousand people affected, 68,000 properties um, number of schools and of course um, significantly um, health uh, facilities as well in particular Charlton. Um, livestock, fencing, roads, um, rail and bridges and so on um, and in particular the local roads because that's one of the things that um, is uh, when you're looking at uh, nearly 3,000 kilometres, uh, it takes a long time to repair. The main arterial roads they get onto pretty quickly, um, but uh, the local roads, um, of course, as we know, does take some time. So part of our spring summer preparedness, so we're running the 15 to float, and that is 15 centimetres um, is enough to uh, make your car float. And our new campaign, which actually originated in uh, Loddon Mallee, um, up in Rochester actually, uh, from that community there, is the um, lift it, bag it, block it and leave campaign. And so if you wanna see some more of that, um, hop on our way onto our hub. There's a bit of a jingle that goes with it. And of course, um, some animation that we're putting out uh, broadly uh, to the community and making that available. So um, uh, quite significant for us and uh, you would have all heard our messages um, that we're starting to put out um, uh, some weeks ago and will continue for the next few weeks. Um, part of preparing communities, um, of course, there's, um, we have a flood guide um, 
uh, and planning resources, so much like for fire as well. We have a heap of resources on our hub, um, including, and I think we'll get there um, now. Yeah, um, we've got some uh, uh, flood um, plans as well as uh, flood guides. And the difference is the um, flood plans tells you everything regarding uh, within a municipality flood risks and so on, and in particular for towns, small townships um, within those municipalities, but also flood guides, which give you a really good general overview of what's occurring. So if you ever get deployed into an area you're not sure of, you can go to the Vic SES website and um, just uh, have, a, have a look at some of the flood guides and get in a quick understanding of uh, what it is um, or the risk um, that we're looking at uh, for that particular town. So what have we done at the moment in preparing the sector? Um, so over a thousand people that we've actually been talking to, um, but that's also our interstate um, uh, uh, people, um, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, of course. Um, mainly regarding our constraints because of COVID, um, but still we're uh, certainly talking about them. Um, we're concerned, of course, how we are going to um, assist if there are cyclones or um, uh, flooding in uh, Queensland, because normally we do send people up there if they uh, request it. So how that's going to affect us. Um, but at the same time, we're still training, we're exercising provided briefing state um, and of course um, uh, to the region as well, um, as well as um, our, all our units um, across a number of um, aspects. So um, uh, every few weeks we catch up with the unit management team and um, provide a briefing on where, where we are um, at the moment in our readiness and preparedness. So this year, um, and just a bit of a quick overview of what our capabilities are. Um, certainly land-based swift water rescue. Uh, we have a number of teams within this region. Um, and of course, incident management team um, within uh, this region and across the state that we um, call on. We've got uh, our mobile command vehicles. Um, they're the, uh, the vans you may have seen around. And of course, uh, the larger uh, Pantech tyre, uh, which we've got a couple of, one in Ballarat and one in central Melbourne. Um, we have staging area uh, management teams, and you may have seen those in the past. Um, we do support and we will continue, um, uh, you guys and others, um, regarding uh, vehicle movements and so on and some of that logistical support that's needed. And um, of course, our um, EPA air monitoring kits and so on. So um, all of that, there's no change. Um, it's just we've geared up a little bit more. Any questions regarding that before we go on to our next, um, next component? So uh, people can pop questions in the chat function or raise your hand if you've got anything. No, very no, good. Nothing, go for it, Andrew. All right, terrific. And it still gets me how I see a raised hand in these machines, but um, I'm sure I'll see it if it comes up. Okay. I'll let you know. um, the yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, we have um, a number of support agencies, and you're across most of those, um, um, particularly yourselves and DELP. Um, Parks Victoria, FRV, Matchment, uh, Catchment Management Authorities, which I mentioned, um, but certainly the Bureau of Meteorology, which is actually a support agency for CFA as well. Um, but we rely heavily on them constantly, like even with our weather for this weekend. I've had two conversations uh, with, the, uh, with the desk um, and they're providing me with updates on what's required. Um, it uh, can be quite dynamic for us sometimes how these storms evolve and so on. Um, but um, we all work together. We certainly, um, um, I think, at the end of the day, um, provide what's required to the community. Collectively, we're able to do it. 
And don't forget a Vic poll in their um, coordination role, as well as a control agency um, for rescue, um, in particular water rescue. So the potential for support roles in our region um, uh, during any flood uh, event, certainly community flood protection. When we, um, when I say that, that's about um, protection of housing and so on, or facilities, evacuation support, that's door knocking, um, rescue um, in general, um, reconnaissance in collecting data, um, uh, incident management team roles, impact, uh, initial impact assessment, and actually that's um, more likely to come from FRV, but you never know, and of course uh, logistical um, support. And there's probably a number of other things there that I haven't haven't listed in there. There's just a few roles that I'm, uh, I was thinking of. So if we pop on to community um, flood protection, what does that mean for us? Um, uh, generally speaking, SES as the control agency for flood um, will lead any of that uh, response into communities. But SES, we don't have units in every township and you guys would know that. And I'll just pick on Carisbrook as an example. Um, uh, high flood risk um, when uh, we have the rains. However, the brigade there, um, uh, we know we'll initiate and undertake actions for the local community and lead it. Um, and we've had discussions down there and they've put some plans in locally, know exactly what they need to do. And while we're the control agency, they're certainly um, supporting us by taking the lead within their community. And um, we uh, have um, uh, trialled that um, in a low level event and it works extremely well. Um, and they've um, really, uh, they're really proactive within their community and it really works well. And once again, um, we're um, able to work together. However, when it gets really busy, um, not necessarily gonna be someone from um, SES um, available to respond. So just keep that in mind. Um, sandbagging. Just wanted to pop over into sandbagging because it's probably the most interesting thing that um, that we do. We have um, um, constantly not only supporting um, people around their residences uh, during flood times, um, but also providing information. And one of the things we find is that most community members actually um, are quite happy to lay their own sandbags. Um, they just don't know how. So we like to spread the message, say, hey, this is how you do it. Um, so um, while we need to remember, if we're doing it ourselves, um, that it's quite significantly um, putting our people at risk if we don't do it properly. In other words, um, you know, bending your knees and taking rest when you need to and all those sorts of things. You've got to remember, each of these bags could be between 15 to 18 kilos dry. Okay, that's quite significant. And just remember that it's not, not always cold and wet when we're laying sandbags, so hydration um, uh, and all those sorts of things um, can affect us. So we need to rest if we need to, um, hats, sunscreen, and shouldn't be wearing clothing that's going to um, make us, um, our body temperatures rise too much, of course. So, um, why don't we have a look how we lay them? All right, quick lesson. All right, we're placing down um, usually a, a layer of plastic sheeting because that acts as a bit of a um, waterproofing membrane. Lay the sandbags uh, like brickwork on top of each other. And you'll notice they're not completely full because they shouldn't be. So half to two thirds full. Um, and remember it's lighter if, uh, to carry um, if they're that way. Um, to ensure the unfilled top part of the bag is covered by the next bag. So you're laying them like brickwork uh, as such and staggering the rows as you need to. And uh, just a bit of a tip there, if you flatten down the sandbag row before adding the next row, it'll help you build a better structure. So where do we place them? Um, we've all seen them in the doorways, um, but um, not everybody's aware of um, 
uh, air vents around in brickwork. Um, not always aware that uh, drainage holes and floor drains will also um, need a sandbag so we stop the backflow of contaminated water. And um, we need at times um, to um, put larger sandbags down to ensure that we're actually keeping the pressure of any backflow water coming back, um, particularly when uh, there's the potential for harmful waste and contaminants, which can occur. So it's wonderful. We've, we now know how to lay the sandbags, but how much sand would we need for a garage door entrance, five metres wide, 300 wide. So I've picked five metres because that's a double garage door approximately. Some of them are a little bit wider um, by 300 high. Anybody? Just a rough, rough guess. No, terrific. Quite what to do, Andrew. They are quiet, aren't they? Okay, so it's about 1.3 cubic metres or 60 sandbags. And I I picked, um, you know, because, I, you know, a metre of sand or whatever, you know, it's easier sometimes to, for people to contemplate, but about 60 sandbags. So um, there's a reason I've put that in there. It's not just to, hey, have a look at this, but be aware of when somebody's asking or tasking you to do something, that we know um, how much uh, or how many resources we need to do it. Okay, so if you think at the time of the day and it's quite warm and you've got to lay 60 sandbags and they want you to do it in half an hour or an hour, we don't have enough resources. So you should ask and inquire how many will that be and is one team of five enough or whatever. Okay, because often um, we head off and it's not just the um, 60 sandbags we've got to do. Um, sometimes it's, um, you know, counts up to 300 or, or even more, depending on what's um, required. So just, um, but I shouldn't scare you too much. On average, 25 sandbags is enough for a house to look after themselves if they've got a concrete floor and it's made out of brick, roughly. Okay, so on to the next thing. Um, okay, evacuation support, um, certainly door knocking. Um, we need to make sure we've got accurate and reliable information because one of the things is that um, when we go door knocking, we need to keep track of who we've spoken to because VicPol, being the um, evacuation managers, would actually need to know that. So with this, while you're assisting us, we're actually all working for Vic when they want us to provide that evacuation support, okay, um, as they are the lead agency for evacuation. Um, really important to um, um, remember that. Okay, reconnaissance. Um, we've often, um, I certainly have, particularly down in Barwon Southwest, used um, uh, other agencies to help us find out what's going on, particularly with storms. Um, I've done that in... Um, uh, around in Geelong and worked really well. So we actually combine teams. Um, our members will know what to look for and what the damage is and what we can do. Um, and sometimes it's about the numbers being able to do it. So we'll go out in teams um, to gather the intelligence. Sometimes we also do it with um, some of the guys who are doing some of the ground um, ground stuff. So it, it helps. Helps us prioritise and or eliminate tasks. On to rescue. Okay, Victoria Police are the control agency for water rescue. And uh, that's determined, and I've written it in there in the EMV. So we actually work very closely. When we've got a rescue, we actually go through the central desk in Melbourne and um, advise them. We talk to them um, through, uh, um, sometimes it's through the local um, uh, policeman who's with us and um, we just um, uh, make sure it's coordinated, that they're aware of what we're doing and um, what's required. So um, moving on to swift water rescue. Um, it's probably one of the most dangerous things um, we, we do, um, particularly around um, flood. It's the only time we really get close to the water. Um, 
for affecting um, uh, rescues. Um, now, um, swift water, water flowing at the pace of a walking speed and above. It's not very quick, um, but I can tell you, it certainly um, will take you away quite swiftly. Um, how about that? Bit of a pun. Um, it's all about safety. We've got a number of um, swift water rescue teams um, uh, for deployment um, across the state. FRV also, who are previously, um, of course, with MFB down in um, down in central Melbourne. Um, it is and can be powerful, relentless, unpredictable. Um, and even for the well-trained and experienced rescuers um, can be extremely um, dangerous. Many unforeseen and unpredictable hazards and uh, can catch out, like I said, um, uh, a well-prepared responder. It kills victims and responders. Um, and uh, that occurs not just in Australia, but of course overseas as well. So we need to keep that in mind. And I'm not sure in this particular slide um, where um, the, uh, I'm sure we've got a, somebody who needs to be rescued there. They're all standing back. Uh, nobody's in the water, which is really good. But uh, as you can see with the flow, it's extremely dangerous for anybody to get in there. So I'm not too sure what the outcome was um, with it. This one, I'm sure it ended well, um, but we've got, I, I can tell you now, there's nobody um, with uh, swift water that are there. Here's an example of an attempted rescue by an SES uh, vessel um, and people in it. Um, so this is um, with appropriate training, um, however, um, didn't go particularly well. Um, and in this particular incident, and I'm not sure exactly um, how the uh, rescue uh, finished up in this incident, um, but uh, we need to often consider alternatives. So it's not always about putting the boat in. It's not always about jumping in. Um, it's about how we can affect a rescue, ensuring that um, everybody is safe. And I'll just show you, um, I'm hoping this will play. I'm not too sure about the sound, um, but can you hear that? I can't hear that one, but. Okay, okay. I'll give you um, a, a bit of a descriptor. This is a rescue in Queensland in 2013. A young 14 year old, I think it was about a 14 year old child. This is a swift water rescuer in the water with him. And he's in significant trouble. They um, managed to get him out okay. I just, I think I could stop that. Yeah, so they managed to get him out okay. Um, but what occurred was that um, the rescuers um, didn't actually um, uh, really think out their rescue, okay? So um, there was a lack of planning uh, and what they did was a reaction to the situation and circumstances without all the resources being on scene. Um, and there was a lot of pressure from those that were standing around. And uh, what they did was instead of following their training, um, actually took action when it wasn't necessarily the safest thing to do. Um, so uh, put themselves at um, great risk um, at the time. So, um, and I believe um, some resources were very, very close to hand, um, but it, it can be quite emotional when you're standing on the side of the bank and um, watching somebody in distress in the water. Okay, so we ask everybody and um, often anybody can come across these situations and we know that um, you guys sometimes also uh, do attend uh, some of these scenes and there's the potential right across the region. 
But what we do, uh, like with anything else that we do uh, across our organisations, we do that assessment, we size it up, um, we do the DRA, look at all those mitigation actions. Um, we ensure the activation procedures. So if we don't have the people there, we call for the right people, right? That um, swift water rescue, we need it, okay? And we've got um, uh, our CAD, they'll press the right button and get um, some of our teams on the road. But also site control, scene management, so that we don't have uh, community members um, putting themselves at risk and therefore we potentially have um, a number of rescues to undertake. Um, so it's really important. Main thing for you guys, uh, you need to follow your own safety um, policies. Okay, so we shouldn't do anything that we don't either have the skills or the attributes to undertake. Um, we really need to make sure that um, uh, we maintain our, our own safety. If uh, we don't, we're unable to help others. Okay, so um, let's just move on a little bit. So um, roles for accredited persons, and this is uh, for you guys as well. You've got chainsaw operators. Um, but Swift Water Rescue, we've got highly trained um, people for that and including uh, flood boats. So it's not just a case for our flood boats of somebody having a boat license. Um, it's certainly, uh, they've got a coxswain and so on and have to actually go through a whole process, including um, the even the um, crew members that are on there as well. Um, and some of the flood protection and mitigation stuff that we do, of course, um, there are some accredited uh, roles that are required there. Um, so our main hazards and, and risks, let's have a look at some of these. Okay, and this is across um, all agencies. So let's just have a look. If we look at the picture there, it's not really one of the main um, uh, sorts of roads that we'd like to drive through. I just, we could see the truck there um, having a bit of a bit of a crack. Um, and we've probably all been in these sorts of situations, but look at the, flood, um, the road signs, um, not far out of the water. So is it the right sort of thing this truck should be trying to do? This one here, um, I'll uh, just show you, there won't be any sound for this as well, um, but I just want I, you to have a look how high the water is. This is swift water, okay? Um, and she's walking across the road. Unfortunately, she doesn't get to the side of the road she wants to, but ankle depth water. So just have a look at this. Oops, oops, yep. So, I mean, a little bit deeper there, but it wasn't very deep at all. Um, certainly, um, I'm sure she was okay. Saw head, you could hear the knock on the head. And unfortunately, she didn't get to the side of the street she wanted to either. Um, so, it that's swift water. This is in that Italy, actually, this one. Um, this one here, uh, you won't hear the sirens, so all the clapping. Um, but just have a look at this one driving through water. We can hear the sound for that one, Andrew, and that's great.
Okay. Um, yeah. Oops. Get on. To, just get on to the next slide. It's stuck. Just bear with me. There we go. And um, there's. Um, so it's not always police. Um, this is my favourite one. Uh, anybody guess why? No, nice and quiet. It's my favourite one because you see the white line that's going through there? Um, I, when I look at this one, um, I would have actually driven through that as well. Um, so a great lesson and that's why it's my favourite. I think look at that and I, I would have driven through it. Doesn't look um, particularly dangerous if you look at the road coming out. Doesn't look uh, like there'd be too much of an issue. Just didn't know there was a big hole in there. Um, and anybody could have done that. Um, and uh, yeah, and not got away with it, of course. Okay, um, just wanted to show this one here. And this is um, once again about just water. Um, sorry, a um, bit of uh, swift water bit of flood. Um, it looked really, really simple and I've seen the video clip of it and we're not going to show it because it can be distressing uh, for some, but um, a, we did have um, a uh, the person that we're trying to rescue actually did die um, as well, um, uh, as well as uh, one of the firefighters um, trying to uh, conduct the rescue. So the um, victim, uh, sorry, not victim, the person um, did um, uh, pop their head up in this particular area, um, but ended up further downstream uh, and the firefighter went went after them uh, to try and help and uh, and died also. So uh, just a bit of a um, bit of a lesson there. So we really need to be mindful and careful. Okay, so um, it's all about safety. Um, everybody um, right across all agencies, we just need to ensure that we report any hazards and or incidents. And when we're in a large um, campaign, uh, whether it be fire or flood or anything like that, um, we need to go through our own agency's reporting system. The control agency will be made aware um, but um, make sure that we do the right sort of thing. And sometimes it's um, even the near misses and so on. We capture those across agencies. We share the information and um, hopefully um, we're able to establish some improvements to either processes or systems. So it's really important. So activities you must not do. Um, travel on the closed roads unless authorised. Enter water bodies where there is a risk to personal safety. You shouldn't drive through flood water unless it's in accordance with your agency's procedures. It is safe to do so. So we need to ensure it's safe. That's uh, really important. Um, the swift water, we've gone through that. And just like we wouldn't and shouldn't enter any fire damage structures, we shouldn't enter storm damage structures either um, uh, without the control agency or the person on scene, um, their approval to do so, just to ensure that we know what the issues are and what the dangers are. Um, and that's right across all agencies. How do we get our information? We're all across the SMEACS um, uh, format for briefings. One of the biggest issues we've had, um, and this is a lesson out of the 2011 and 2016 floods, is that we've found some crews haven't asked whether um, or how they should be doing some of the jobs they've been tasked with. So it's really important that if you don't understand the tasking request, um, please um, seek further clarification. And um, one of the main things is ask yourself, does your crew have the skills to do what has been asked? Because you can say no. So it's all about safety. Just make sure, look after yourselves and your crews. And there we have. How's that? 15 minutes early. Any questions?
Thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, there was one from Nick earlier. So you've talked about the rain forecast, but do we have a temperature forecast or is that very hit and miss? No, no. Interestingly, um, uh, temperature wise, they're saying there's not going to be uh, less likely of having um, single spike days, but, um, you know, and that's extreme heat spike days that we had last year. Um, they're suggesting that we're going to have more um, days of um, uh, heat waves. You know, so above those 30s, you know, those 35s, around the 35s or whatever, um, for longer periods. So if we think about it last year or the year before, generally speaking, we have maybe a couple of weeks a year where it's uncomfortable. Um, they're expecting a little more um, uncomfortable days, so that higher humidity um, for an um, extended period, so more than that one or two days. Yeah. Cool. How's that? Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, Mike yeah. Rogers, Mike, you've got your hand up. Um, you can turn your microphone and video on if you like. Yep. Just one for Andrew. What um, safety precautions do you do around power? Like Around uh, power? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, in regards to, sorry? High, high voltage um, leading to um, houses and so forth during the flood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. One of the things is we ask um, uh, all households, and it's part of our messaging, um, is uh, to isolate, turn off their, their power. If we find or see, just like any of you guys, see a power issue, we, we stand back. We don't, won't go in and we can't. And we'll talk to um, one of the um, uh, electric, electric um, suppliers, you know, power core. But isolation of power into houses is important, as you know, and I'll just add, of course, a lot of the power points around the floorboards, um, and uh, so they should turn their power off at the um, at the main power board. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Andrew. No worries. Uh, cool. Uh, I've got another one from Brian. Do your communications vehicles have any capabilities to communicate with CFA vehicles? Uh, great question. Um, yes, yes, we do. Um, we need to ensure that we actually have a, um, a common uh, channel established, um, but we certainly can uh, communicate um, uh, across agencies. A little bit um, easier for us. Uh, you guys haven't got quite the same radio as we have. Um, but we certainly can. We've got um, just the same sort of thing of um, established um, incident management um, uh, channels and so on. But um, yeah, we can certainly do that and set that up with a good communications plan should the need arise. Thanks, Andrew. Any more questions from anyone? Uh, John Pierce, go ahead. Hey, hi, Andrew. Just a query on your chain of command from your, say, a fatal incident up to, say, an ICC. Do you have such things as sectors or divisions? Or just how does it work normally for, say, for the SES incident? Yeah, good question, John. Uh, thanks for that. Look, it's it's very very similar, but it's, um, I suppose, initially our um, uh, plan, I suppose, is that we have that's always sitting in the background is uh, municipal based. Um, so if we looked at uh, an incident control uh, facilities, as you know, across agencies, we have three in this region. We have Gisborne, Bendigo and Mildura. Um, for floods and storms, um, we have wider footprints and we use just the Bendigo and Mildura facilities as incident control centres. Then what we have in each um, municipality is a divisional command uh, facility or identified facility that we would use. So if we look at um, Castle Main, uh, there's the CFA facility there that we would use. In Bendigo, it's the SES facility. Um, in Echuca, it's the CFA facility there. 
and in Gisborne um, is the CFA facility down there. So established local um, headquarters or local facilities that we would use. And that is our, um, I suppose that's our default. Um, and then from there, uh, we would have the sectors depending um, where the need is. So very flexible where the sectors need to be. So for Bendigo, we might have a sector out at Morong, Eagle Hawk, um, I'm just trying to think where we've had them in the past, uh, Morong, Eagle Hawk, maybe even out, um, uh, possibly even out of Big Hill, which could be um, floating, but um, a mobile uh, uh, van, um, one of our comms vans, but predominantly we go for fixed facilities um, as the uh, standard. Does that ask, John, uh, or is there something else I missed? No, that was uh, perfect. That's all I need to know. Uh, uh, for next time, hopefully, we won't have a next time. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think the main thing is, um, while it's, we have a default plan, we need to be flexible, so depending on where the incident and how it's evolved and so on. Yeah. yeah thanks, thanks, John. Andrew, I've got one for you. Um, when you've got sure. a, a big event coming through, how do you prioritise which jobs are most important? Because um, a bit different yeah. to fire, we might have one job and we get everyone to go to that one, whereas you might have lots of little ones. Um, yeah, yeah, no, great, great question. And um, when I first came across to SES, it really, it was very difficult for me to understand how this all worked. Okay, so... Um, with fire, as you know, you have one fire event and that's it. And there could be a number of spot fires and all those sorts of things. Um, with a storm event um, and even flood as well, we have a number of distressed um, uh, residents and uh, with different issues and they will ring and establish each one of those would be an incident for us. So in Bendigo, it's probably easier to describe that um, we could have a number of um, residential um, buildings that have had trees on their sheds or that sort of thing, or some flooding. Um, and each one of those would be an incident. And then we would have um, right on the outskirts, no, no damage to a building, but their driveway is blocked by a tree and the blocked driveway becomes a priority for us because they can't get in or out. So generally speaking, if we have um, people stuck somewhere, that becomes our priority. Um, if it is deemed a rescue, that's a priority. Um, and then it goes down the track uh, from there. However, we can shift those things and we need to be flexible because we could have an old people's home or a hospital or a care facility that has a severe flooding through the roof or something like that that we actually need to attend to and that would actually shift right up in um, the priorities yeah last priority is going around and chopping up firewood for somebody but we have on occasion done that um, to help some people and while we're there and there's not many jobs on we've done that yeah and so do you that sort of explain the, it yeah. yeah yeah it does and you've so you've got the ability to to prioritize that locally rather than at a state level? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what happens is, um, uh, and I'm not too sure if everybody else is aware of the IMS, see if I have IMS as well. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, system that was built in 1928 and we all still use it and we have lovely add-ons and so on. And um, what we're able to do is, um, say in Bendigo we get 150 jobs, um, we're able to sort them out through the, this um, program into suburbs, into streets and so on. And then what we do, and this is done at a DIVCOM level, okay, and sometimes out in a sector, and they'll go through and ring some of these people and start a triage, okay? So we'll have somebody in the facility in a DIVCOM triaging. We'll have somebody sitting on IMS, and these are volunteers, and the best operators are actually women because they don't get confused by all the noise that's hanging around around them and they will prioritize and then pass out um, the
the any of the jobs that need to go out and and so on and distribute those so they're the basically they're the controllers of the whole incident or the divisional commanders who decide how that occurs uh, in bendigo um, without too much assistance they can handle about 150 jobs we get concerned when they start to get over that and it's building um, but it's all subjective because we could have a small township um, uh, like a, a Birchup or even a Chuka where we've got low members, um, but a job could be 20 kilometres out of a Chuka to the west and then they'll get another job that's actually 20 kilometres out to the east and then all of a sudden their capacity is very little. So when we have 15 jobs that are like that, um, it actually, um, we've got to get them support. But once again, they prioritise those locally and then we contact them and they say, yeah, we need a hand now because we've got 10 roof jobs or we've got a number of rescues that we've got to attend to. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, locally, absolutely. Um, empowered um, and all we do as staff is um, provide any assistance um, that they need while they're doing that and ensure that they get everything they need to do the job. Cool. Uh, Mike Rogers, you've got your hand up again. Go for it. Yeah, Andrew, just wondering, are you um, um, planning on sandbagging out of Bendigo, you know, um, like we used, uh, have done in the past with the assistance of CFA to um, fill sandbags and so forth? Yeah, look, absolutely. Um, Whenever we have any of these uh, um, uh, flash floods, and in Bendigo it's predominantly flash flood, um, we certainly uh, we call on all our partner agencies. Um, I think one of the main things you um, we all need to understand, and I've got to keep reminding myself too at times, is that right across this whole region, we have 24 units, okay? And they vary in numbers, um, and some of our larger units are uh, in Gisborne, uh, certainly Mildura, uh, Swan Hill and Bendigo, um, but a lot of the units are a lot smaller. And uh, we've got a unit in Birchip and Witchy Proof and some of these other towns like uh, Castlemaine and so on. We don't have a great capacity. And if you think about when even in Bendigo you've, we've got 150 jobs, and there are 150 people that we need to go out and see and ensure uh, that they're okay. We don't have the capacity on our own. But collectively, um, uh, particularly with you guys, um, we we do. And that's how we've um, certainly run it in the past, as you're aware, Mike, um, and uh, yeah, how we're going to have to run in the future as well. So that's collectively uh, all working together. And it's just the same as when we assist you guys um, in fire in any way where we can as well. Uh, so, Andrew, I've got one that's popped up from Trevor Roach in the chat. Uh, noting that yeah. all FRV, uh, ex-CFA pumpers, are designated as rescue vehicles, is SES still the designated road accident rescue agency for road accidents that occur within the new FRV districts outside the old Metro Fire districts? So, Bendigo, for example. Yeah, great uh, question, Trevor, and thank you for that. Um, uh, FRV um, and SES, we have a number, and right across the state, FRV um, uh, are the principal providers, as um, some would know, in some areas, um, whereas SES are in others. Right across this um, particular region, um, uh, SES are the principal um, uh, providers of road crash rescue. Um, and so the pumpers, um, particularly in Bendigo, if we talk about um, FRV in Bendigo, uh, the secondary, in other words, they're the support um, road crash rescue provider. Does that answer the question, Trevor? Don't think he's got his mic on there. Um, so, yeah, look, are there any other questions? Feel free to um, pop your mic on and ask away. Uh, I think that might be it, Andrew. Uh, so, okay. th and it's it's just going eight thirty now. So, thank you so much for coming on board with us tonight. Um, 
it's uh yeah it's shaping up to be an interesting weekend we'll see whether or not um the predicted rainfall comes along and uh, or, or any of the storms and uh i think it's timely we've had some uh, some word from ses with our members yeah the rain will happen i've just washed the car yeah. <laughs> thanks <Pete. laughs> yeah yeah and and just remember too that um uh you know we could get um, some good sustainable rain um, through this period. Um, for us, for riverine and flash flood, it's all about where it falls and how quickly it falls. And nobody at this stage can predict, apart from knowing that uh, it looks like we're going to get some rain somewhere. So just keep yeah. that in mind. Great. All right. Well, look, if uh, some thank yous coming in, if there are no other questions, we'll, we'll pull it up officially there. Um, and I will just open it up for general chat. So, um, I, 